Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our discussion with Matthew Fox about Pope Francis, a pope who in many ways has brought liberation theology, or much of it, to the Vatican. But this is a Vatican that relentlessly fought against liberation theology and anyone who advocated it for decades. But as I said in the part one, and you really should watch part one before you watch part two, it will make more sense. But this pope more or less compared Trump's election to the rise of Hitler and the, the rise of the far right in Europe, um, has called the, the entire capitalist system as we know it today as one worshiping the god of money and ruining the earth. Um, and this has let loose a, a big fight within the Catholic Church or a continuation of fight, except this time the pope seems to be on the uh, liberation theology side of the barricades. Um, now joining us to talk about all this is Matthew Fox. He's the author of over two dozen books, including Letters to Pope Francis, The Pope's War, and Occupy Spirituality. He's a former Catholic priest. He was first stopped from teaching liberation theology and creation spirituality by Cardinal Ratzinger. Then he was expelled from the Dominican order to which he had belonged for 34 years. He's now an Episcopal priest. Thanks for joining us again, Matthew. Yes, Paul, good to so, be with you. So, as I said in the first episode, we, we expected a more conservative pope based on what we knew of his history. Uh, do you think the cardinals who voted for the pope, do you think they were expecting a more conservative pope? Are they all, is, there, is the whole church a little surprised of, of what he's become? Definitely, I think there's a certain buyer's remorse among some of the more conservative cardinals. I think, on the other hand, uh, the few progressive are quite pleased. Uh, and then now, of course, the Pope Francis is trying to create some more progressive um, appointments. For example, in America, the Bishop of Chicago, uh, named Cardinal, and uh, a new bishop whom he appointed. And then in Newark, they just appointed a pretty forward-looking fellow as Cardinal of Newark. And interesting enough, he's not made the Archbishop of, of Los Angeles, which is a huge diocese, uh, a cardinal at all, which which is very unusual, but that fellow is young and he's opus dei. And uh, I don't think as long as Pope Francis is around that um, opus dei bishops are going to be made cardinals in the United States or anywhere. And for those who don't know, uh, opus dei is a very right-wing sect or trend within the church. It's a religious order founded by a Spanish fascist priest in the 1930s, Escriva. And uh, yeah, it's extremely, it's extremely secret and it's extremely fascist, explicitly fascist. They worked with Franco. They were on his cabinet, in fact, Opus Dei lay people. But um, under Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, uh, Opus Dei really came into its own and they, they banished, if you will, the liberation theology cardinals uh, in South America, for example, and uh, reinstated them with Opus Dei bishops and cardinals. So it was a, a huge shift that happened in that time. Well, was the Pope playing a bit of a, a game in the sense that not letting the other cardinals know the kind of politics that he was going to espouse? Because it seems like, you know, kind of a 180 in some ways. <laughs> well, actually, he, he was runner-up in the previous election, the election of... Uh, of Cardinal Ratzinger and, and who became Benedict the Sixteenth, so he was in the running even back then. But remember too, he's he's the first third world uh, uh, pope, and this is one reason why I think he has this very clear and explicit understanding of the uh, opprobrium of savage capitalism. His phrase, um, because uh, he's felt it being in the third world and. Uh, and I think he's lived long enough to have have diagnosed and analyzed uh, what's really going on. I think that's one reason he speaks with such uh, passion about the the fallout of um, triple down economics, for example, which he's very fierce against, and and Wall Street in general. So um, yeah, I think it comes from his experience as a third worlder. Now, you yourself were the target of what you said in a previous interview was something like akin to an inquisition within the church targeting liber th liberation theology priests and, and running them out of the church as you were yourself by Ratzinger. Has that stopped under this pope? Has that inquisition been closed down? Yes, it has effectively stopped. Um, yeah, he's not, he's not 
uh, doing that. You know, they still have a fellow, a German cardinal in charge, another German cardinal in charge of the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, which used to be called the, the Sacred Congregation of, um, of the Holy Inquisition. But um, this fellow is definitely tempered by the present pope. And the present pope talks about, let's hear from all sides, when he had this uh, Congress uh, a year or so ago about family and all this, he was real explicit about let's hear everybody. And, uh, you know, that he's definitely inclusive. And this is one reason a lot of the right-wing uh, forces in the church and, and among the cardinals are, are up in arms. Uh, and a good example is this Cardinal Burke, who has a big influence in the Trump administration because uh, none other than Stephen Bannon, who's, as we know, is, has an office right next to Trump there in the White House, he and Cardinal Burke have a, have a thing going because they met a few years ago and um, Bannon really liked Cardinal Burke and vice versa. And of course, they both like power. So it's scary because one, one author who studied this has said that, um, has called it theofascism. He said previously we've had theoconservatives in the White House under Bush and all this, but now we have theofascism uh, in the White House. Okay, go back to Burke. Now, when the Pope had this uh, session on the family, Burke and some other cardinals, I believe, actually signed a letter publicly disagreeing with the Pope, which is that's right. Se seems a bit and much given that, that he the Pope is supposed to be uh, never wrong. But, uh, <laughs> Well, this pope does not invoke infallibility, thank God. But you're right. It was very unusual. Four popes said that he has to retract four this. Four cardinals. Yeah. To, four cardinals, excuse me, yeah. And, um, and they, you know, they went public with this, which, again, is very, very unusual. Um, but he kind of sloughs it off, and, and he just says, let's hear from everybody. And he, he's not backing down from what he's written. Well, he's actually, uh, now he's ex, I mean, he's gotten rid of Burke, right? He sent him to Guam and took away <laughs> his big job. And he's, he's, he's but, willing to fight these guys. Well, that's right. First, he sent him to the Knights of Malta as a chaplain. He took him away from being head of the Tribunal of, of, of Justice, the Supreme Court, really. And that was a demotion, tremendous demotion. I didn't even know about him sending him off to Guam. That, I think that really just happened funny. in the last day or two. No kidding. That's amazing. Guam he's, was a long got, way He away. sent him there to adjudicate uh, some kind of sexual abuse case uh, where he has oh. to hear evidence and things. But the way the newspaper, the article was <laughs> playing it is essentially it's a kind of exile to get. A one a one so, way ticket. He gave him a one way ticket. <laughs> I'm not sure, but it might have been. Well, I, so I, what, I what feel, message that's how I feel significant for the people is in Guam? I feel for the people in Guam, but yeah, except for that it's a pretty interesting solution. Yeah. What's that now? <laughs> so how big a deal is Burke? What message does that send within the church? Well, what does it do? How seriously organizes the right to try to oppose Pope Francis? And what can they do against him? I mean they can't get rid of him. Uh, no, but of course they're all praying for an for an early death, and of course his his uh, his health is not is not the best, and he you know he's not a young man, and a lot of these Opus Dei cardinals and archbishops that were appointed by the previous two popes are young people. Like here in San Francisco, the archbishop is in his fifties, I think. He's he's Opus Dei, and then the archbishop in in Los Angeles is Opus Dei, and he's also young. So these guys are gonna live longer than, than Pope Francis. So it's gonna be very interesting what happens after Pope Francis dies. He's trying to appoint new, new cardinals more in his, in his mindset, but uh, you know, it's kind of a slow process. But um, there's no question, I mean, if Burke is on the phone and email with Stephen Bannon, which he is, uh, that clearly the right wing has a lot of power even in these circumstances, not directly in, under given the Pope's uh, worldview, but certainly indirectly. Then, then, of course, a lot of money, a lot of right wing money uh, uh, follows these, the Opus Dei movement in the Catholic Church and, uh, and people like Cardinal Burke. And Burke is really the lightning rod to attract all the extreme right wing forces. He's kind of risen to that status, probably because uh, Pope Francis uh, was so explicit about demoting him and now, now sending him to Guam. I, I just think that's really interesting news. I mean, let's talk about the Pope's health. Uh, how serious 
are his afflictions. Uh, you know, he, in one of his interviews, in fact, it's, I think it's that same uh, interview with the Spanish newspaper, he talks about how, he's asked about corruption. He says, well, corruption is pervasive, but it's not just now. It's been like that even in our church. And he mentions the Borgias. And then he particularly mm -hmm. mentions the, the daughter of Borgia, who, who he mm -hmm. says was known for her poison. I mean, poison and the Vatican are not strangers to each other. No, they aren't. No, not at all. And uh, yeah, yeah, from the day he was elected, I think uh, I was certainly advising people to have a good taster to check his food out because, uh, well, John Paul I, the Pope before uh, John Paul II, who lasted only a month, uh, all the evidence is that he was murdered, and that would have been, you know, in the early 1970s. So, I mean, this is recent history. This is not just new history. And John Paul I definitely represented the progressive awareness of Pope John the 23rd, who called the Second Vatican Council. And yet he was young and very healthy and very vigorous. And he gave a talk the day before he died. He gave a talk on God as mother and not just father. And he was he was uh, he also gave a talk on his committing to before in the Vatican Bank. Within 24 hours, he was dead. And there's been a serious investigation by a detective, English detective, on that. He wrote a book called In God's Name, and uh, he concludes that definitely it was a murder, and definitely it had to have some inside help uh, from some of the cardinals participated in that in that demise. And the Pope, of, Pope that John follows Paul that death had fairly close relations with the CIA. Very close relations. I was told by a CIA agent that he was their man in Poland for 25 years when he was bishop and archbishop. So he was groomed. And then I, I have this, all the facts on this in my book, The Pope's War, that um, after Reagan was sworn in, within two months, there was a gathering of the NSA people in Santa Fe. And their one question was, how can we destroy liberation theology in Latin America? And they concluded, we can't destroy it, but we can split the church. And so they went after Pope John Paul II, um, uh, John, uh, Jim Casey, the head of CIA, who was a very right-wing Catholic. He went to the Vatican 29 times personally, with satchels full of cash, to give to JP II for solidarity. And in exchange, JP II would go after liberation theologians and base communities in South America. Solidarity being the happened. solidarity being the very pro-Vatican trade union in Poland that led helped lead to the fall of the uh, communist right. or whatever you want to call it regime in That's Poland. That's right. One priest in Latin America told me that John Paul II murdered at least 10,000 people in Latin America because of his policies on behalf of the CIA. Um, to destroy base communities, base community leaders, and liberation theology. That's what this very sober uh, priest told me. So how, uh, you know, in terms of global politics, in the previous interview you compared him to the Dalai Lama. I mean, how significant do you think the Pope's voice is in pushing back about in this rise of the right? How, how much does it influence broad public opinion? Well, it's interesting how Little of it gets into our news in America. Now, uh, it, you know, when he was, for a while, he was all over the news. And now the more yeah. progressive he is, the less we hear of him. Exactly. Is that a surprise? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think that. And then, too, you know, the left in America tends to be so secular in the sense of anti-religious. And I think it's a big mistake because uh, look at look at the red and blue states, you know, the red states are kind of into religion. So we should be confronting bad and hypocritical Christianity. For example, I've just written a public letter to Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan carries his Catholicism on his sleeve, but he contradicts everything that the Pope is for. For example, the whole issue of global warming and caring for the earth. He completely ignores that. He completely ignores a whole bit about uh, the one percent and the, the God of money and the savage capitalism the Pope is talking about. So I think it's time for us to really get proactive with the hypocrisy of all these so-called Christian politicians who are running things. And so I think the left is really dumb if it thinks that you can change America without addressing uh, religious concerns. Uh, there's good religion and bad religion. And Pope Francis represents the traditions of justice, which is the prophetic tradition of Judaism, and, and the 
really the healthy tradition in Islam and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the rest. So this, I really think that's one of the left biggest mistakes in America is thinking that you can change people without a sense of spirituality. And what it does, it leaves open the whole arena to the crackpot uh, Christians. And there are a lot of them, as we know, and it's ridiculous. So, and of course, the media is in on this, as you say, they're not letting us know what uh, Pope Francis is saying. And um, uh, I think they should. All right. He's an important figure. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Matthew. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for joining us on Very The Real News Network. Work.